to be uh, some comments on TT bar, JT bar, and string theory. Uh, it's based on quite a bit of works that already appeared uh, recently uh, in collaboration with various combination of the people that I mentioned here, but it uses relatively old results from uh, the uh, previous century, the late 90s. And um, now, uh, what I'm going uh, to try to describe within these uh, 90 minutes is uh, holographic duality, uh, which is <coughs> conjecture, of course, like uh, all uh, holographic dualities between uh, perturbative string theory on certain solvable well sheet uh, CFT backgrounds that uh, I will describe via examples, and solvable irrelevant deformations of uh, the space-time CFT2 were examples uh, that worked out explicitly that I will present today will turn out to be uh, TT bar deformations on which we heard a lot in this uh, meeting. But there will be uh, uh, new things that string theory will give us uh, immediately, like uh, JT bar deformations and the combinations. And I want to emphasize that uh, what is going to be produced here by just standard perturbative string theory methods that boil down eventually to calculations in uh, free field theory of scalar fields in two dimensions will give us conjectures slash predictions for new results that are not that trivial, at least to me, to uh, prove uh, in field theory, most of which we have been able to prove, but some of which are uh, still left open. So uh, in order to be sure, that uh, you see these uh, conjectured results in field theory, I put, which is supposed to be the end of the talk, but I cannot predict well in advance how much I will be able to say, so I wrote down concrete conjecture, uh, which is the following. So I have here a conjecture that uh, the spectrum of uh, TT bar deformed theory plus JT bar, where J is some um, holomorphic U1 current that the initial CFT2 happens to have, has the following spectrum. The energy is a certain solution to a quadratic equations with coefficient A, B, and C that are given in terms of the deformations parameter T. So my T, I believe, is the minus alpha of Sasha's notations. Um, and nu, which is the uh, dimensionful uh, coupling of the JT bar deformation. A has a certain combination of mu squared minus T divided by R squared. B is minus one plus a term that behaves like mu over R times the charge of the initial state in the CFT2 with respect to the uh, U1 symmetry. And there is a T over R squared terms time the uh, integer momentum. So I consider a CFT2 on a cylinder with radius R. And capital C is twice H bar minus C over 24, where H and H bar are the left and right scaling dimensions of the state I started with in the uh, undeformed CFT2. And the conjecture for this spectrum arises from the holographic duality that has to do with a very simple three-dimensional background uh, that I wrote explicitly here and I drew uh, with a cartoon here and which I'm going to try to explain. And the very important thing about that particular background in string theory is that it amounts to an exact Welchy theory, which is a certain current, current deformation of the SL2 times U1 uh, model uh, on the group manifold, which is uh, 
a well-established uh, CFT2. Um, whose result I'm going to use. Now, I, want, I know that the audience is mixed. And even though uh, the results that I'm going to use without teaching are one standard textbook perturbative string theory results, uh, I will have sometimes to say, look, this is what standard perturbative string theory give us. Those who studied elementary string theory course will know what I'm talking about. Those who didn't we know that they will have in mind how to obtain these results once they study it. Other type of results that I'm going to use without explaining are consequences of the ADS-CFT2 duality in the case of three-dimensional anti deceitful space. Um, again, you know, it's a whole course to teach the details of how one obtains these results, so this I'm not going to be able to do in 90 minutes, so I'm just going to use results. And when you look at papers from the late 90s uh, and a few years later and various reviews, uh, you will have all the material needed to see how to obtain these results. <coughs> so, questions so far? Now, there are many motivations to consider these theories, and I mentioned a few of them. I think I wrote them here. Yeah, I wrote them here. So, uh, one motivation is uh, that it turns out to be a step towards holography in uh, asymptotically flat uh, space times. And uh, the other one, uh, which is to me is very significant, is that it could be an important step toward understanding horizons, singularities, closed timeline curves uh, in string theory, and therefore if string theory is theory of nature, then in nature as well. Um, why do I say that uh, within this context uh, we are going to explore uh, the physics uh, that I mentioned here, so it is presented in the cartoon. So, uh, ideally, within the ADS-CFT context, it would be very nice if we could, say in technical words, we could keep the one in the harmonic function that we dropped when we approached the uh, near horizon ADS background. Concretely, what do I have in mind? Uh, in the ADS5 uh, CFT4, the ADS5 n equal to 4 swooping and this duality that I assume that everybody heard about, uh, what is done is you begin with uh, the supergravity solution for a stack of D3 brains in the, the type uh, to be superstring. And that solution you can write, and it's given in terms of uh, a harmon harmonic function. And technically, going to the near horizon slash decoupling limit on the D3 brains amount to dropping the one from the harmonic function. And then there is an established duality, uh, the well-celebrated uh, ADS-CFT duality uh, for ADS-5 and Supreme Wilson four dimensions. Now, ideally, it would be much better if we could have a holographic statement for the full theory with the asymptotically flat space-time regime. I'm not going to uh, give you uh, today an answer to this uh, very interesting question, but I'm going to provide an answer for an analog thing, where instead of the theory on three brains, I will have the theory on fundamental strings. Now, how is it going about? So, the D3 brains, in the example of the D3 brains, we put D3 bands in flat 9 plus 1 dimensional space time, and we went to the near horizon regime of the D3 bands, and we obtained ADS5 and the duality that I mentioned previously. In the analog of fundamental strings, I do the following. I begin with a space. Now, ignore, ignore this, uh, this thing for the moment. 
I begin with a space that is a flat space time, where I take one of the special coordinates to be, uh, okay, so I have time. I take one of the special coordinates to be circle of radius r. And I have a radial, what I will refer to as radial direction. At the moment, it's just one extra dimension, which I will parameterize by uh, a real scalar phi. But I add to this direction a linear dilaton. with a slope uh, which I parameterize by the number q. Such, uh, asymptotical, such space-time can be obtained, for instance, in the uh, near horizon of a stack of k5 brains, uh, in which case uh, this parameter q is uh, the square root of 2 divided by the number of ns5 brains, and I Keep this parameter k because it will appear all over the place later on. Even when it has nothing to do uh, with the stack of NS5 brains. So, but here I don't really care where this came from. It could have come from five brains in flat space time. It could have come from five brains dropping some cycle in Calabiao. I don't care. All I have in mind is that I have some super string. Uh, by the way, for concreteness, I, when I talk about perturbative string theory today, I will talk always about uh, superstring. Um, so I begin with uh, a superstring on time times a circle times uh, R phi with uh, linear dilaton times some internal space that can be anything I wish, such that it's a superstring. And I can specify precisely what the properties of this n should be, but it's not necessarily for this uh, lecture. It's going to be a complete spectator. And I can obtain this picture, in this case, in the following way. So first I put n fundamental strings which wrap the circle. So I have a stack of uh, fundamental strings whose world volume is RT times S1R. Uh, this is the analog of putting the D3 brains in flat space time in the higher dimensional case that I described previously. Sorry. Yes? Where are the NS5 brains? Hmm? Where are the NS5 brains? There are no NS5s. N the NS5 brains were just an example. Oh. If you consider, say, a parallel, k parallel NS5 brains, and you look at the near horizon of the k NS5 brains, then the particular space that you get is, uh, well, you, you get what I, uh, you, you <coughs> you, it's going to be confusing, but since you ask, uh, uh, you're going to get RT times R phi. Um, Suppose that you have a five brain whose uh, uh, world volume is uh, S1 times T4. Then for the particular case of a stack of KNS5, you're going to get this space, so this N will be a very specific one. But it's just an example, and since this is going to be a spectator anyway for me, I don't restrict to this case, but for whoever wished to think about that particular example, it's fine with me. But uh, for me, that K is not going to be an integer number even, but Okay? <coughs> now, so if I consider the background of these fundamental strings, uh, it's a particular case of what already appears here. It's just to look at uh, this case, and I will look at, the, at this later on in more detail. 
Uh, it's looking at this particular background in the particular case that uh, epsilon or mu is equal to zero. So the harmonic function that I have in mind is this one. In the near horizon of the fundamental strings, the one which is lambda here, but lambda without loss of generality can be either plus one, minus one, or zero. Uh, so dropping that amounts to go to the near horizon of the fundamental string, in which case one obtains ADA3. And the full picture that I have is a space where an ADA3 whose boundary is the cylinder, RT times S1, R cups the throat with a linear dilaton as I described before. As I will show, this is not just a picture that has a metric, but it is also an exact Wurtschitz CFT2 background because it turns out that this particular example is a certain current anti-current deformation of the SL2WZW model. Questions at this point? This uh, WZW model for uh, so there are no remote remote model. I will describe it in detail later on. And generically, when I say <laughs> perturbative string theory, what I have in mind is a string theory with parametrically small string coupling. And in case the world sheet C and on the world sheet CFT2, and in the case that the world sheet CFT2 has a sigma model description, it involves only Navesh Schwartz, Navesh Schwartz backgrounds. More questions, yes. I'm not, dis I, you, uh, you asked two questions. Okay. One, I'm not describing the D1, D5 system. Instead, I describe the fundamental string NS5 well, sure. system as an example. Yes. And it's the most ordinary thing to me. It's not uh, less ordinary than the D1, D5 system. To me, it's more ordinary because I can use perturbative string theory tools to study this. Of course, there are lots of dualities and bias dualities, etc. You can relate these systems to systems that involve Ramon Ramon background, but I'm not going to discuss this. Yes? This ADS3 in the cylinder, is that just the regular ADS that we draw on the cylinder? Or it's not ADS on the cylinder, it's an ADS whose boundary, boundary is a cylinder. I will describe in detail an example. And by ADS3 whose boundary is a cylinder, I have two options in mind both necessarily appearing in the superstring. One is ADS ring uh, uh, global coordinates, and the other is uh, uh, ADS ring the Poincaré patch. After compactifying the special direction on a circle, which turns this into a so-called massless BTZ, and that example I will describe in detail. In the superstring, we have to um, include both because the former is in the CFT2 dual, uh, goes to the Navesh-Schwarz sector of the dual superconformal field theory in space-time, and the other go to the Ramon sector, and we need both for modular invariance. More questions? Okay, so, but the... As, as I promised, I will go in detail into uh, particular examples that can be worked out precisely. But before going to uh, boring, precise, precise things that give rise to the result, I want to give you a heuristic argument. How uh, Titi Bar, that was uh, you know, a big player uh, in this school, how Titi Bar appeared in this context of string theory, we heard already uh, from Offer a different way by which it appears in string theory. 
and I emphasize that uh, this is a different story. And after I give the details, I would point out what, where the differences are. So when I say TT bar in <coughs> string theory, I mean something different than what Offer described when he talked about um, an ADS with a Dirichlet wall. So uh, TT bar in string theory, and that this will be a heuristic argument for how it appears, but I uh, promise later on within the example that I call M3, which is uh, J minus J bar minus, J minus is the null generator of SL2, the formation of ADS3. This will be a concrete, particular, solvable example that uh, will uh, establish a uh, proof in quotation marks or without quotation marks of this heuristic argument. <coughs> ah, but just before, I, 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 before going to the TT bar case, uh, as you can see, I drew more cartoons. So, and, and again, I want to emphasize that I, the story is not just about this smooth space and it's holographic TT bar or better, I, it should be called, whenever I say TT bar in my context today, it's better to call it single trace TT bar and I will explain uh, what I mean about it when it will be more appropriate. I will forget the single trace and we call it TT bar. It's an abuse of precise for an order not to say, but in this talk, TT bar, JT bar, 95% of the times is single trace. Um, and you may, okay, I, I will try to define it later on. So uh, I want to emphasize that when I restrict to, uh, when I restrict to uh, this particular current, current deformation, I land on the smooth space that I described previously related to TT bar. But when I do more general cases, I have more general solvable irrelevant deformations of CFT2, and the geometries are also more involved. So for instance, if we do the TT bar deformation with the other sign, with the sign that in Sasha's talk was, I think, alpha bigger than zero, and in my talk would be T smaller than zero, then I get a space which, whose cartoon is this. Instead of a smooth space, where an asymptotically flat space-time with a linear dilaton is capped by an ADS3, I have a space that inside, in the infrared, it looks like ADS3, but as one go away in the radial direction, at a certain point there is a singularity, and beyond the singularity there are closed time-like curves. So roughly, we can consider this patch of space as a imitating the interior of a black hole, and the other piece is the regime beyond the singularity. Now from the point of view of the current current deformation of SL2, from the point of view of the current current deformation of SL2, um, where was it? From the point of view of this deformation, it's, it doesn't look like there is such a big difference. One case amounts to taking the deformation parameter to be positive, and the other corresponds to taking the deformation parameter to be negative. It's very tempting to think that if string theory is a good theory for one sign, it will be a good theory for the other sign. And actually, there is a so-called axial vector duality I don't want to get into the names unless I will have time to mention about it later. It's, there are actually signs that the two are related by a certain transformation, but the bottom line that I want to mention is that from the perturbative string theory point of view, it doesn't look like the positive T and negative T, or positive alpha and negative alpha in Sasha's talk are so different.
Yes. No, the watch in CFT is deformed by current current deformations. In space time, in the dual, in the holographically dual space time, this will be dual to TT bar deformation of the space time CFT2, which was dual to string theory in ADS3. So the watch theory will be solvable in the sense that it's a current current deformation of a solvable theory and it's a solvable world sheet theory. The space, from the space-time point of view, if we wouldn't have some logic of works, from the space-time point of view, it would be a big surprise that the theory is solvable. But from this holographic duality, it's not a surprise. Once we establish that the space-time theory has to do with TT-bar deformation. Can you do also uh, the deformation in the world sheet in the TT-bar? Let me talk about this now. <laughs> um, okay, more questions? So I'm start I let's see what is the time. It will be very difficult for me to put things in ninety minutes, so I put wherever I put the bottom line I already presented, so it's Um, so I want to give you first a heuristic argument for how TT bar appears. Again, for those who are familiar with perturbative string theory and the ADS-CFT correspondence, in string theory it's two lines calculation. For those of you who are not, you will have to believe that what I quote here is correct. Okay, so yes. Uh, so I thought I did it in advance, uh, but it will become, I tried to do it in advance because I knew it will be difficult. Um, where did I do it? I have all these boards. But so uh, this particular deformation of ADS3 will turn out to be dual to what I call single trace TT bar. This kind of deformation will case the holomorphic current in an S1. So this kj bar minus deformation of ADS3 times S1, which upon kk reduction <coughs> is reduced to a space that is well studied in the literature, it got the name warped ADS3, and uh, it appears, that's why, ah, it's this cartoon, and it appears as uh, the simplest toy model in the context of the so-called Kerr-CFT duality, and as the simplest uh, example in the context of the so-called ADS called atoms duality. Um, it's a three-dimensional uh, Schrodinger space-time. So this will be uh, the three-dimensional geometry which amounts to a KJ bar minus the formation of ADS three times S1, which in space-time will be related to JT bar deformation of the space-time CFT2. And the full conjecture that we're sitting here is combining the two. And the strings are where? Which strings? The string theory is on which, which of these manifolds? So in this case, we have string theory on ADS3. In both cases, we have string theory, say, on ADS3 times S1 times N. The super string on ADS3 times S1 times N. Okay, does it answer your question? Maybe it will be clear as we go on and you see examples. Okay, so I want to give you a heuristic argument. So I, I start with this picture, so I don't have to draw it again. So I make, I consider a theory that has the following two properties. Property one, asymptotically, it looks like R phi times RT times S1R with a linear dilaton. That's property one. Property two 
in the infrared, the ge geometry is ADS3, whose boundary is this cylinder, and they are glued together. I can make, in particular, this implies that in the limit that the radius R of the S1 in string units goes to infinity, uh, the spectrum of the theory reduces to the spectrum of the CFT2 dual to string theory in ADS3. I don't care where it came from. I just assume that I have a theory which has such a property. This N3 is an example that has these properties. Now, what do I obtain uh, in such a theory? So I write an equation, and then I'll try to explain what I write one. So property one implies the following. I try to prepare in advance some notation here. Ah, good. I have them here. Okay, so property one imply this, and I explain what it is. This is the mass shell condition for a string wrapping W times the circle with some momentum N on the circle. And again, standard analysis of such a free field theory of a compact scalar field tell us that the left and right handed momentum for such a string are given in this form. Okay? So this is this piece. E is the total energy of the string. And it will be convenient for us to uh, split the total energy to the energy E above the BPS energy of the wound fundamental string on the circle, which is WR over alpha prime. So th this explains this piece. This string is moving in the radial direction with a momentum governed by this quantum number j, and I want to use this quantum number j because it has natural interpretation in the SL2 theory. It's the kind of usual quantum number of SL2 uh, analogous to the j in SU2, so I prefer to use this letter, but if I want to be more precise and I, 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 I write j as minus 1 half plus is, then the radial momentum with which the string moves, the radial is S, proportional to S. It's S divided by square root of K. And the fact that this is not a complete square of S has to do with the effect of this linear dilaton. And those of you who have studied these things know this as a triviality. Those of you who never saw it, just take it as granted that this is the equation. So if I write uh, uh, physical vertex operators in the superstring, and impose the on-shell condition, okay, that uh, L0 is equal to 1. For this particular state that I described, ah, but I didn't describe this number. So this ring has uh, excitations, left-handed and right-handed transverse excitation that I denote by N. NL for the left movers and NR for the right movers. Questions? For total, because I, I, I keep E for uh, this. More questions? Okay. So uh, this is what, uh, 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 this is what property one implies. Now I'm going to use what property two implies. Now if you go to the literature on the ADS3 CFT2 correspondence for the superstring on um, ADS3 with just Navesh Vars, Navesh Vars background, then you can find equations that tell you that this must be equal to W times 
times H W minus K W over four. It's the winding, so I, I consider a string oh, it's winding, winding w, w times around the circle. Okay. I have to explain to you what are the letters here. So W was just re-explained. H W is the scaling dimension above the SL2C invariant ground states of the dual CFT2. For a state that involves W long strings in the ADS3 background, whose boundary is the cylinder, and the KW over 4 has to do with the fact that each of the strings, and those strings in ADS3 are directly related to the strings that form the background, carry central charge 6K in space time. For those of you, uh, who are familiar with this topic, it was just a reminder to refresh their memory. For those of you who do not understand anything of what I said, you'll have to learn it if you want. But it's already a standard thing established in the context of the superstring on ADS3 and it's CFT2 dual. Yes? So H is the weight of which So, starting from the superstring on ADS3, the space-time theory is a CFT2. Operators in that CFT2 have scaling dimensions that I denote by H. Uh, and actually, I should put here left and right, because I have, for each state, in that CFT2, we have a left-handed dimension and a right-handed dimension. And each of them satisfy this relation. If N left is not equal to N right, that will be different. So it's that scaling dimensions, and within the context of the ADS3 CFT2 duality, for perturbative string theory, without one more on background, this is a well-established result. The left -hand side is a consequence, yes, what's the question? The left-hand side is the boundary, and, the, and this is the world sheet, the right-hand side is world sheet, quantum number. Yeah, so this equality is equality that follow from the relation between world sheet parameters to the space-time CFT2 Holography. language. The full superstring is consistent. It does not have tachyons. I don't want to go into that. I don't want to go into that because of lack of time. The full superstring is consistent. It has no tachyons. If there will be time, I, I, I just don't want to get into it because of lack of time. But the bottom line, I consider a consistent vacuum of string theory. It has no tachyons. It's a full-fledged consistent theory. No questions. OK, good. So now uh, it's a piece of cake. This is equal to that. So I will rewrite it. This is equal to that. To that can be written in the following way. Sure, it takes less time to do the exercise than to write the results here. This is precisely the equation. This is precisely the equation. Suppose I start with uh, a, a CFT2 with central charge 6k that I denote m. And I do a TT bar deformation 
with t, minus alpha of Sasha, equal to pi alpha prime. I claim that this, I claim, I mean, okay, it's obvious, it's, I will convince you if you wish. This is precisely the spectrum of, uh, this TT bar deformed CFT2, symmetrically product. So it's the, it's the spectrum of a symmetric orbifold of a CFT2 with central charge 6K by a TT bar deformation where the coefficient is alpha prime. Uh, by the way, while I try to be careful in writing the conjecture result at the beginning, I think at some point, in the talk, pi will be equal to 2, will be equal to 1. Uh, just uh, to allow me not to think too much. But hmm? Minuses are important. <laughs> Minuses are very important. But this will not be important when, when I will use. OK, is it clear why uh, this statement is true? Is it not clear? Uh, so RW is W times R, R is the, NW is, uh, what is, no, this is nonsense, NW is WN, where N is the original, uh, uh, what this uh, equation tells us is that uh, the spectrum of a string winding W times on the circle with momentum N is the same as a single string wound I mean, it's the same as a string would once on a circle, which is W times bigger than the original one, and with momentum that is W times bigger than the original one, and this is precisely what one expects in a symmetric product. So if for W equal to 1, we obtain the zamolochic of equation for the spectrum of a TT bar deformed CFT2, then it explains completely my statement. So let's look at W equal to 1. So a W equal to 1, and let me, for simplicity, uh, set n equal to 0. I let you, as an exercise, edit, and it will match <coughs> the correct equation. Uh, so for w equal to 1, uh, the solution to this equation is that e is equal to, let's see if I can get it without looking, um, alpha over alpha prime, just uh, by dimensions, I guess times minus 1 plus the square root of 1 plus 4 alpha prime divided by r squared h minus c over 24 with c equal to 6k. So uh, the solution to this quadratic equation for w equal to 1 is precisely the energy of a TT bar deformed CFT2 with central charge 6K if T is alpha prime. What did you use for H bar? Hmm? What did you use for H bar? H bar? <laughs> uh, for N equal to 0, H is equal to H bar. More questions? Okay, so that's the end of uh, uh, the important part of the talk. From now on, I'm going to present some technicalities. So if you have more questions now, uh, that's the time. Why, why did you use double equals one? Ja so I, I made here two states. I, I, I made a statement that this is the spectrum of this symmetric orbital. <coughs> I use W equal to one to show so, okay, it's, uh, I didn't explain it. Uh, the map between this and the spectrum of a symmetric product goes as follows. The W equal to 1 amounts to the untwisted sector of the uh, <coughs> symmetric uh, product CFT2, while the W bigger than 1 amounts to the ZW twisted sector of that orbifold. And... Uh, Okay, you can see, for instance, that in the infrared limit, when you take R over L string to infinity, 
uh, necessarily well. It was an input, so it's not a big deal that uh, this equation tr uh, turns into HW equal to H1 over W plus K over 4 W minus 1 over W, which is precisely the equation for the relation between the dimension of operators in the ZW twisted sectors of a symmetric orbifold in terms of the block whose central charge is 6K. <laughs> but, okay, uh, that's actually a block because here I used it as an input. It, it's automatically obtained from that one. And uh, after the deformation, the structure remains. But th there is, uh, it reminds me, there is something, yes, I'm sorry. Uh. So, I mean, you, you <coughs> demonstrate this uh, uh, duality by taking one particular quantity, the energy, but what about other properties? Of I'm sure the duality is correct. Well, I'm sure. I conjecture the duality is correct, so any other property will work. But let's go on. Uh, proven nothing was proven. Okay. It's left for whoever wished to prove More questions? I tried to explain, <coughs> so I will leave it like that. So if you don't see it, take my word, and then think about it five minutes, and you will see it. Yes? So we're in, on the string theory, the string theory but where's the effect of the deformation? In which term? Current deformation? Well, anyway, I... It's alpha prime. No, what? So what, what is your question? I thought, I thought, if the question is what is the scale in string theory, which has to do with the formation parameter, the answer is alpha prime. So Maybe you your question is different. So you're making a deformation in the string theory that, that gives the same spectrum as a deformation in, 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 in oh, but Here I started from the deformed background. I didn't consider, uh, I didn't consider a, ADS really deform it. In this heuristic argument, I started from something. Now I'm going to do a deformation. I mean, the next thing that I'm going to do, well, what I plan to do next, but uh, there is something important here. Okay. What I'm going to do next, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, however, uh, this I don't want to erase. What can I erase? Um. Huh? Lambda Defo lambda you mean where is t? Where is small t? Yeah. It's alpha prime. Oh, you say what is lambda? Yes. Here I chose la as I said, without loss of generality, lambda can be either one, minus one, or zero, because I can get rid of it by a shift of, of phi. So here I chose lambda to be one. Okay. If you wish to edit, the question is, how can I edit if I w if you want? Uh, uh, it will be uh, if I will choose if I will glue things such as the radio series different than the radius here. It will bring back lambda, but it's it's unfeel it's it's not important. Uh, it will become clearer. So I, I I want so this was heuristic argument. And what I want to go through is to uh, a particular example that I mentioned previously. Um, I want to describe this example, which is this deformation. And here lambda will appear. But it also will be redundant to you. It's either plus 1, minus 1, or 0, actually. Um, uh, OK, because you can, al you can always turn it to 1 or minus 1 by changing r. Okay? And um, so I want to describe this uh, CFT 2M3. But this CFT 2M3 is a J minus J bar minus deformation of massless BTZ. So I do it in two steps. First, I will consider the super string of massless BTZ. And that will give you some idea on how to treat uh, the super string on ADS3. Massless BTZ for me is uh, ADS3 in Poincare coordinates. And then I will deform it and we'll find the deformed spectrum and we'll confirm what we already know. And it will also establish the tools of how to 
do the more general cases. That's my plan now. In the context of M3, it will be, it will not be mysterious how TT bar appeared. The reason is that if we go to uh, works from the past, from 99, 98, etc. So I just want to make this comment and then uh, uh, I will continue with uh, So M3 is an example. And uh, it is uh, it is this uh, uh, deformed ADS3. So uh, in order to see why there is no mystery in the result that I obtain heuristically, we have to recall what does J minus J bar minus amount to in the dual space-time CFT2 before I did the deformation. And we know that th in the dictionary, this is what is going on. So x, our space-time coordinates, and z, our world sheet coordinates. This operator on the world sheet amounts in space-time to an operator that I call dxx bar, which has the following properties. It has scaling dimensions 2, comma 2, and it transforms like tt bar under the t of x and t bar of x bar of the space-time CFT2. So tt bar is an example of an operator that satisfies these properties, but it cannot be TT bar. It cannot be TT bar because TT bar, in the language that offer explained to us, is a double trace deformation. But this is a truly marginal deformation of the world sheet. It's a mode of the graviton dilaton, so it's a single trace deformation. So it's an operator that has very similar properties to the double trace TT bar, but it's not. So what else can it be? So the simplest example of what it can be is in the context of the symmetric product. In the symmetric products, we have immediately two operators that obey these conditions. One is TT bar, but there is another operator, which is the sum of the TT bar i in each of the blocks of the symmetric product. So it is in this sense that I refer to the deformation as a single trace deformation. Now, we don't have a proof that the dual CFT2, and therefore its deformation, is precisely a symmetric product, but there are good arguments for why it should be at least very closely related to it. Um, but it's an open problem. What is the precise structure of the dual theory? So having said that, I want to do some more, to present some more concrete calculations that are not heuristic, but are calculations. So I want to begin with uh, the superstring on massless BTZ. And then describe its uh, J minus J bar minus deformation. Okay, so... Uh, Massless BTZ is described by the following uh, Lagrangian. And now I rush, because I don't know how much I have. I started five minutes late, so I have a little bit more than uh, half an hour. T 
This is a way to write down the uh, Wurzschild Lagrangian with Navesh Schwarz, Navesh Schwarz background on ADS ring point correct coordinates. So gamma is gamma 1 plus gamma 0, and gamma bar is the one with the minus combination. And now I compactify gamma 1 on a circle, and that turns <coughs> this background into massless bit easy. It is convenient to uh, rewrite this theory in the so-called Wakimoto variables The only thing that is important here is that there is a way to work with a system of three fields that are called beta gamma, for which this same action is written in this way. And after integrating out beta and beta bar, one recovers the original theory. And this is useful because for any property that can be calculated in the boundary, if phi goes to infinity, I can ignore this term, and then I'm left with a free theory part of which I call L phi, which is the theory of a free scalar field with a linear dilaton, and the uh, beta gamma fields. It is further useful to bosonize the beta gamma in this way, to write gamma is I phi minus, and beta is I. I'm sorry? Beta gamma is a one zero system? Yes, yes, you can read all the details from the Lagrangian. I gave you the Lagrangian, and I'm not going to describe uh, the technology, it's a, well, hmm? it's a, hmm? okay. uh, give me time, I can explain it uh, easily, it's, I give you the Lagrangian and everything follows from it, and I have to rush because of uh, lack of time, uh, so it's really, for those who are not experts on this, it's just to give them a taste on what's going on, but it's really very elementary, just, you know, two-dimensional free theory. So I uh, bosonize gamma, in, I choose to present phi minus, and I write beta as uh, id phi plus. Uh, incidentally, this is precisely the generator j minus of uh, the SL2 symmetry that this theory has. And phi minus and phi plus are light-like fields that obey uh, this property. So I can think about phi minus as uh, phi 1 plus phi 0 and phi plus as phi 1 minus phi 0. Well, phi 0 and phi 1 are time-like and space-like uh, correspondingly. Now to obtain, so with these fields, the Lagrangian takes the form d phi minus d bar phi plus plus d phi plus d bar phi minus plus L phi. And I do not care about things that vanish at phi goes to infinity. So it is this Lagrangian that I'm going to study. And it's nothing but a theory of free scalar fields, one of which has a linear dilaton. L phi is the top of the line L phi is this. Now, in order to establish the BTZ black hole in this language, I have to uh, introduce a twist <coughs> that implements this uh, periodicity. And that twist field can write as TW, it's e to the IW, phi minus, phi plus, maybe, phi minus, phi plus, should be in J minus <coughs> direction, so it's phi plus. I have to introduce the twist in this language that implements the compactification in this language. And this is the operator of those. And now it's a standard orbifold methods in free field theory. The full CFT2 is obtained by writing down operators that are mutually local with this 
and consider also their twists, and that will give me the full spectrum of the theory. So after doing that, the operators in this orbifold CFT2 take the form, let's call them VBTZ. Of course, just a class of operator, but it's, I'm I, I, I restrict myself to a class that is sufficient for doing what I want to do. probably the other way around. There are going to be many typos of this sort from now on. It's Lagrangian in the world sheet, Lagrangian. Yes, it's world sheet. I didn't do the super string yet. I'm <coughs> doing the world sheet bit easy. <coughs> and then from that, we'll construct the super string. Well, E left, E right. can be written in terms of the energy and the momentum in this way. And the fact that n is integer is to implement the mutual locality with this operator. One can uh, easily calculate the scaling dimensions of these operators, of this operator, and the scaling dimension of the left-handed and right-handed piece is just minus W E left or E right minus JJ plus 1 over K. Minus JJ plus 1 over K comes from the piece in the linear dilaton direction. And this uh, WE term comes from this piece and the fact that phi minus and phi plus are light-like coordinates that obey this OP. I leave it, of course, as an exercise to do this kind of calculations. Yes, but for the purpose of what I'm doing, everything that I do is valid at large phi. Everything that I obtain in what I obtain today at large phi is exact. Is exact. Yeah, I study a CFT2 in this background. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm studying exact properties of the full theory, and I use these methods for which it's justified to ignore completely this term. If I would like to calculate correlation functions, I will have to take into account this. It's, it's called, uh, 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 well, charge operator. I don't, in this context, so for in correlators, I will have to take into account its uh, uh, existence. But um, okay, now I want to do the super string. So for the super string, I uh, consider the uh, massless BTZ times my internal space, and now in the super string, the certain class of vertex operators will have uh, the piece from BTZ <coughs> times uh, the internal thing, and they have to obey the on shell condition. The onshell condition is that the delta from BTZ that I wrote here, I have left and right. Let me not denote left and right. So everything that I write, I have to write separately for the left movers and the right movers. Let n be the dimension of the piece in the internal space. So my, in the super string, that minus one half has to be zero. Plugging in the value of delta into this equation. We find that E, okay, now I put left right after my big speech, is this form. This resembles uh, what people who are familiar with uh, matrix string theory, the properties of matrix strings, describe a symmetric product uh, theory, 
of uh, three uh, strings. And uh, and that's it. And now, uh, now, uh, now I have to remember that for a CFT2 on the cylinder, E left right, which is the left and right added energy for a CFT2 on the cylinder, on the theory of W strings each carrying a central charge 6K, is precisely equal to what I refer to as job HW minus KW uh, over 4. So uh, actually, what I showed you here is uh, establishing what I quoted previously in my heuristic story for massless BTZ. Question so far? What, what is the range for J? Okay, so that's, uh, all these questions are very good. Uh, so I'll just say it, but I will not explain it. It has to do with the representations of SL2 that I, uh, so uh, for long strings, J must be equal to uh, minus one half plus is, and let's suppose that I consider this case here. It is referred to as the continuous principal representations of SL2, but there are also discrete states for which uh, J is real, but it has to be bounded between minus one half and K minus one over two and so on for unitarity and so on. So again, this is a whole story that I cannot present here, uh, not because it's so complicated, but just because of lack of time. Um, so for the purpose of having in mind what I discussed now, think about J as being minus one half plus I S. And then what this equation tells you is that uh, the energy, so we can think of this equation as describing the energy of W long strings in the background of massless BTZ. In massless BTZ, these strings are free. They have zero potential and they can move anywhere. And what this equation is telling us is what is the energy of these strings which carry radial momentum S, or proportional to S, in a transverse excitation N. That's all. So now I want to turn the formation. So now I want to study, uh, having done that. What should be erased? Let me put for myself what I do not want to erase. If I try to erase it, stop me. Uh, okay, so now I want to do the super string on M3. So let me tell you first what is M3. So M3, as I said, I take uh, the Lagrangian for ADS3 and I add to it lambda J minus J bar minus. J minus looks like uh, e to the 2 phi D bar gamma and similarly for J bar minus. It can be worked out explicitly. It was done long ago. I think Stefan Forster who did it first in 94 uh, when he was a postdoc here. Uh, and, uh, okay, and the result is a sigma model background whose metric <coughs> is this one 
with f being f inverse being lambda plus e to the minus 2 phi. So when lambda equal to 0, we go back to idea 3. And when I say idea 3, I mean massless BTZ or whatever. But when phi goes to infinity, this f inverse is lambda, and we get just an asymptotically flat space time. And there is also a dilaton here. Actually, I didn't have to rewrite all this because uh, it was part of the general case, but I wrote it for you anyway. So this background is precisely uh, uh, described by uh, this cartoon. But now it's an exact world sheet CFT, whose spectrum I'm going to compute for you. Okay? So what is the spectrum? So to do the spectrum, it's most convenient to work in the phi plus phi minus variables. And in the phi plus phi minus variables, because this is j minus, and I wrote previously that j minus, because j minus is i d phi plus, then adding this deformation is nothing but adding to this Lagrangian a lambda d phi plus d bar phi plus term. So it's still <coughs> a theory of two scalar fields, two free scalar fields, but now the two-dimensional uh, metric in the phi plus phi minus direction, instead of being flat one, minus one, minus one before the deformation, it's now this one. And uh, we need to find the spectrum of this simple free field theory in two dimensions. And in order to set the ground for calculating all the examples that I want. I want to remind you what is the spectrum in general language. So in general language, if suppose I have a theory of uh, free scalar fields, uh, with uh, background, with constant metric background G and anti-symmetric field B. Here I don't have uh, anti-symmetric field B, but in the other example I will have it as well. Then the spectrum of scaling dimensions of primaries in this theory is half P left or right square, depending if I do the left movers or right mover. Well, P left right is n transpose plus m transpose <coughs> b plus minus g times uh, e star. e star dot e star is uh, half g inverse. That's a standard so-called uh, Narain method for calculating the scaling dimensions of uh, this theory. Thank you. And if you don't want to copy results from standard textbooks, it's a free field theory with some boundary conditions and constant background fields. So in this context, now the scaling of these dimensions, are, uh, this piece I can leave, I, I, I only have to add to it uh, what arises from uh, adding this lambda, and I think that it will be adding to it minus lambda over 2, e left, e right. So after I deform the theory by lambda, the scaling dimensions of the operators that are deformed from these ones get shifted by this term. I leave it as an exercise to do the calculation. Again, it's a free field calculation. It's trivial. Free fields are trivial. OK, now I can do the super string. So now I take this delta and plug it into the on shell condition that I wrote previously. And the mass shell condition translate into HW minus KW over 4 being equal to uh, minus W e left to right. So uh, for the uh, BTZ black hole, that was the on-shell condition. 
But now we have a correction that comes from this piece. It is minus lambda over 2, e left, e right. Okay? And this is nothing but the equation whose solution is the spectrum of a TTD bar deformed m to the n modded by Sn with, uh, with uh, T behaving, I guess, like lambda r squared. I can put in equality because my pi's and twos are one anyhow. So the spectrum of the superstring, the spectrum of the superstring on this background is that of a TT bar deformation of a CFT2M with central charge 6K symmetrically product. This establishes the result that you know, requires you know, to do some elementary study of how to do the calculation, which heuristically I obtained in a minute previously. Okay? So now let's see where I go depending on the time. <coughs> how much time do I have, Shmuel? Ah, oh, that's good. So, okay, so now, uh, now we have the methods that allow you to do whatever you wish within the context of what I described. So here is what you are supposed to do in order to get this result. What is N? Uh, so, okay. In this level, N goes to infinity. But if I remember, I, but I think about the background as being, um, it's, a, it's a good question. I think about N as being related to the number of fundamental strings that form the background. And if I consider a background which is formed by N fundamental string, you will find that G string square behaves like 1 over N. So 1 over N is the string coupling. Now all the methods that I use here are done for G string equal to 0. And everything is obviously going to get corrections in 1 over n. So every single thing that I said now is obviously correct up to corrections in 1 over n. So I'm trying two minutes to tell you what you should do as an exercise to obtain this conjecture. And with the time that is left, I'm going to tell you the, to me, the most... Uh, interesting and important consequences that could be to these stories we have to do with uh, horizon singularities, closed time like etc. etc. Uh, so in order to establish this result, what you have to do is to consider this deformation. In the language of this deformation, this, uh, in the language of phi plus phi minus, you will have now, a th you will now have a three-dimensional space parameterized by phi plus phi minus and y will be uh, the scalar that will uh, parameterize the extra S1 that I put you on. And the particular case that I described previously, massless BTZ was this one. Adding to it the thing that was dual to TT bar was this one. And if I uh, want instead to do the KJ bar minus deformation, it will amount to doing this thing. Well, this is G plus B. I'm too lazy to write them separately. G is the symmetric piece and B is the anti-symmetric piece of that. So you have to, uh, you know, uh, if you want to consider uh, the spectrum of this theory, you put that into this formulation and you obtain the spectrum. And I guarantee to you that if you do it correctly, you'll get the spectrum written here for lambda equal to zero. If you want to do both, Put lambda here. Probably your mathematica can already spit out the result for any parameters for this three times three matrix. 
And I guarantee to you that if you put both, you get this equation. So it is tempting to conjecture. Now, for the same reason that the J minus J bar minus in the dual CFT2 was dual to uh, an operator with dimension 2,2 two, that transforms like T, T bar under T and T bar of the space time, it was shown that this operator on the world should correspond to space time to an operator with dimensions 1, 2 and transforms like J, T bar under J and T and T bar of the space time theory. K is the U1 current in the S1 that I use here. I didn't call it J because it will be confusing. Um, so we are led to conjecture that the spectrum that we obtain in the sector W equal to 1, which is written here, is that of TT bar plus JT bar deformation. And we established, so if you wish, it's a conjecture. But that conjecture was proved already. Proved, by proved I mean here that it was shown to be correct in field theory with reasonable assumptions. In the JT bar case, and in the complete case for zero momentum. That's the situation with this story. Questions on that? So now I want to go to this picture. So far, I have restricted to the less interesting case, in my opinion, for which this is the picture in the TT bar case. So secretly, although I'm not sure if I mentioned it to you, I consider the positive lambda case. See, the harmonic function that appears here has this smooth picture when lambda is positive. However, what is happening when lambda is negative? When lambda is negative, there is a singularity with the when the harmonic function vanishes. A curvature singularity. This is what I drew here in the cartoon. So this is lambda bigger than zero, and this is lambda smaller than zero. And beyond the singularity, space and time are interchanged. So now we have, beyond the singularity, we have closed time like curves. So the geometry looks pathological from that respect. But, you know, from the current current deformation, what is the pathology? So let's assume it's not pathological. Then we have here a hope that we consider a space which resembles an interior of a black hole, the regime between the horizon and the singularity of a black hole, and a regime with an asymptotically linear dilaton in this case beyond the singularity. This has nice match, as it should, with what seem to be pathologies in the TT bar deformed theory with the alpha positive or lambda negative here, which appeared in the talks of Sasha, David, and Ophel. And they are the following. One, in this particular case, there is a maximal value of the energy above which the energies develop complex dimension, uh, imaginary piece. So they become complex. That maximal energy uh, is bigger the smaller t. The same is true for the geometry. The singularity appears at a value that depends on lambda, and it is more farther away the smaller lambda is. So it is tempting to associate the complexity of the energies in the UV with the appearance of the singularity beyond which there are closed time-like curves in the geometry. But if one can make sense of the TT bar deformed theory with the bad sign, that will be fantastic because that would mean towards resolving singularities in string theory. Of course, it could be the other way around. It could be that they are both sick and um, 
but there is at least something to look at here. In the partition function, there was also a property that seemed to be very nicely associated with the geometrical picture here. What David showed is that in the positive sign case in my language, when the background the geometry is smooth, there are no non-perturbative ambiguities in the partition function. On the other hand, in the other case, there were non-perturbative ambiguities. I want to suggest that perhaps these non-perturbative corrections are not ambiguous in string theory and tell us what precisely they should be, and I can give some hand-waving arguments for why and what. Uh, although there is uh, resistance to that. Uh, but nevertheless, one the way or the other, in the dual field theory, if you don't care where it came from, there are non-perturbative uh, ambiguities. And it is tempting to associate those, again, the perturbative piece for which the energies, uh, the perturbative piece, they're not big, it's, it's, and the energies are really, it's, tempting to associate them with things that live inside, in the interior of the black hole, while the complex energies <coughs> in the UV and the non-perturbative uh, non perturbative ambiguities to be associated with what is happening beyond the singularity. You know, I, these are just words. I don't have equations like the equations that I showed you so far, so it's really like open projects uh, for investigation. Um, okay, so that was still just the TT bar case. What about the JT bar case? In the JT bar case, for which the background is this one, actually there are no curvature singularities. But the same pathologies appear. In the JT bar case, if you look at the spectrum, that I don't have the time to write it unless I will be given a few more minutes to make it apparent. But for the JT bar case, if you look at the spectrum written here for uh, t equal to zero, and say you set n equal to zero for simplicity, you will see that the equation for the energy is precisely the same as that for TT bar with negative t where mu squared is equal to minus t and t is negative. So the same pathologies that appear in the spectrum in the TT bar deformation with negative t appear in the JT bar deformation. But the space has no singularities. What does it have? It has the property that beyond a certain value in the radial direction, I take two more minutes, maybe one, uh, beyond a certain va value of the radial direction, Oh, I have more minutes, I started later. <laughs> uh, so, uh, beyond a certain value of the radial direction that behaves like 1 over mu, there are closed time-like curves. But the pathologies are identical. So it is very tempting to conjecture that the complex energies developed in the UV, as well as the non- and there are also the non-perturbative ambiguities in the partition function, that David did not have the time to show in detail, but appear in the papers. So it is very tempting to conjecture that what are apparent pathologies in the field theory have to do with cross time like there's no singularities at all, because here there is no singularity. It, it looks like the singularity was not the essence here, but only the closed time like curve, because here is something very similar with no singularities. To see if this world's uh, match general results, you can look at this general result, and what one can easily check is the following. If you look at this space, now there are, is one parameter here that I can change, uh, uh, that parameter, so you see this, this A, A behaves like epsilon squared minus lambda. When I use the notation that were there, they were kind of lost within U and T, and the fact that I actually cheated a little bit, epsilon and lambda appeared time and again when they should be rescaled by factors of R over L string and so on. I was sloppy. But in the end of the day, the truth is that this parameter A in the language of epsilon and lambda behaves like this thing. And it is easy to see from this equation that 
for instance, imaginary energies can appear if and only if A is positive. Now can one attempt to look at the geometry and ask oneself, when does the geometry has close time like curves? And it turns out it's very simple to see it. You know, this, there is an F here, an F squared here, and F behaves like lambda at large phi. So if I take out these two Fs and look at large phi, this F is 1 over lambda, so I have something that behaves like this, minus epsilon squared over lambda, and I already showed that closed time like curves will appear if and only if epsilon squared minus lambda is bigger than 0. So we see within this full family of theories that closed time like curves in the geometry appear if and only if the energies develop an imaginary piece in the UV and the partition function when it can be calculated. By the way, uh, I should emphasize that studying the properties of the partition function in the general case is, was not yet done. It's work, in pro it's work in progress with part of the people whose names were written on the, the board, so it was not yet established. But everything else that I said here was already shown. So I guess I will stop here. What's the you should ask the expert. I'm not, I just quote, I mean, there were papers by Son and I think McGreevy and Bala Subramanian, where they, I think that initiated the whole topic of the so-called ADS condensed matter theory, right? Where uh, in higher dimensions, not in this case, uh, they called the dual condensed matter system, the system of cold atoms, and I'm not the person to ask why they called it by this name. The only thing that I noticed is that particular warped ADS Rebecca that is obtained in the KJ bar minus the formation of ADS three is precisely the background that they used in the three dimensional case in their papers. Yeah. So this with lambda positive and lambda negative, these two separate cases, you also say that lambda could be zero is a possibility of what happens there? That's ADS three. No, uh, but there are very closely related phenomena in uh, the field theory, which are the following. You heard a lot about the S-matrix in these cases. And it turns out that while for positive lambda, the S-matrix give rise to time delay, for negative lambda, the S-matrix shows time advance. A time advance leads to close time like curves. So it's very tempting to think that the two <coughs> are related. But there is a lot to be understood in that that I wish that someone will explain to me. Yes? On general grounds, you have mentioned the possible relationship between this and the plus piston over the problem. Asymptotically flat piston, yes. yes. This is, of course, a very, very modest step towards holography in asymptotically flat uh, uh, space-time. It takes us from ADS to asymptotically flat space-time with a linear dilaton and for the particular case of three-dimensional ADS. So I want to emphasize that it's a rather modest progress. While these things that you talk about, perhaps you, you think about in four dimensions and so on, on which I have nothing to say. But in this particular case, the related thing that I expect, I expect, I mean, you know, the solvability of these irrelevant deformed theories, uh, cry for enhancement of symmetries. So it's clear that these integral models have huge symmetries, and I would suspect that the integrability, namely infinite symmetries that also the deformed theories have, have to do with the things that you mentioned in higher dimensional cases. But it just a reasonable speculation on which I have nothing clever to say at the moment. Okay, let's thank